Okay, thank you for attending. Uh, I'm Baptiste Daroussin. I'm a FreeBSD developer, uh, part of the core team, port management team, and I'm worked so working for Gandhi. So uh, you may know me for the package manager in FreeBSD, a uh, bunch of tools like Poudrier, uh, other thing I may have broken on your system since. Uh, and I'm now slowly discovering storage, and that's the purpose of this talk. So I'm working at, in Gandhi uh, for a year now. And the goal was to uh, refresh our filers for, uh, that are backing all the Gandhi um, services. So first, what is Gandhi? Gandhi is a domain name uh, company. So we are selling domain names since 1999. Uh, but uh, we also provide certificates. Uh, and we provide hosting services through uh, what we call simple hosting, which is kind of pass and servers which are uh, YAS, so our virtualization cloud, cloudish stuff. Um, we're doing that since 2008, and we have uh, using uh, ZFS for a while uh, to back those services, and we're very happy with it. Uh, the thing is, uh, the current setup was made in 2007 and based on NextCenter, and we wanted to get something a bit more modern for various reasons. Uh, because with Nexenta, it's very difficult to uh, set up a non intended setup, uh, and we want to be able to deploy new, new uh, fighters uh, without having human intervention or reducing the amount of uh, work the, the people would do on it. Um, we had a bunch of kernel patches. We got one of the things we didn't like was each time we changed the, provide, the manufacturer for the disk. Uh, to get multipass, we had to uh, modify some configurations or patch some part of the kernel uh, to teach the kernel that they are allowed to get multipass. Uh, the Python version that chipped with uh, those Nexenta was 2.6 and was fairly buggy in uh, areas where um, in APIs that we were using. So we had to work around in our code uh, the, the part that were buggy which was kind of painful, and we had to get stuck to, uh, I think it was Python 2.4 or 2.6, and it was a problem. Uh, the other issue we have is uh, when um, we reboot those filers, it takes a fairly long amount of time to, to get back into a uh, running state. Uh, by, by a fair, very long amount of time, I mean, if we got a kind of crash, which happens from time to time, uh, the longest one could be until 45 minutes. Uh, 45 minutes, including the, the boot of the OS itself, is not very fast, but not that slow. Uh, but that will import, because we didn't have the threaded import at this time, is very uh, slow. And the iSCSI export, uh, we had to do per disk, uh, pass a command to the daemon, and so it could take a lot of time to be able to expose all of them. Uh, so we made a study on where to go uh, since those very old uh, filers and if we, what operating system we will use, uh, what will change, given we were quite happy with the design of what we made, so we wanted to stay uh, quite close to what we had. So when doing the study, we made a bunch of requirements we wanted to keep. So uh, ZFS, of course, we wanted to keep it. We are very happy before that we were using uh, other Linux stuff, and we're very happy when we moved to ZFS. Everything was so simpler, so easier. Uh, but we wanted also uh, the ability to, for each server to have minimum of 1,000 uh, data sets that we will serve over NFS, and around 1,000-ish uh, data sets we will serve over uh, iSCSI. Um, we want to be able to extend on those new filers. So uh, as I said before, the next center were slow to boot, so we decided that this was a limitation of the number of uh, data sets we wanted on, on ZFS. Uh, because uh, if we add more, it would take more than 45 minutes. So we want to get fast boots, but we want also to be able to add more data sets. We wanted a very good NFS v4 support with delegation. Uh, and the one we had in Nexenta was good enough, and it, we're, we were happy with it. So we wanted to not change this setup. Uh, we wanted powerful debug debugging tools. In particular, we used a lot of D-Trace, uh, but we were also using uh, MDB for uh, various things. So we wanted to be able to get at least the same level of debugging tools that we had uh, on the next centers. We wanted to um, be able to access, of course, the JBOD through uh, multipass because all our disks are on a separate JBOD. 
we wanted an active open source community. So Gandhi is a company that is uh, are using a lot of open source software and tries to get back a lot by patches or by supporting different various communities. So we want a community. We don't want to keep our own patches. Uh, we are too small to be able to, to, to uh, maintain our old patches for a long time. So we really want, if we find, I don't know, a, a panic somewhere, we fix the panic. We want to be able to upstream that as soon as possible. So when we do the next refresh, we don't have to deal with thousands of patches uh, that may or may not apply anymore. Um, we wanted uh, also the ability to run containers, uh, which were not used until then, but we decided that it would be a good idea for some of the services that the provider are providing to be able to contain them into a, a container. So by container, I mean something like zones or uh, jails. So of course the candidates uh, were uh, the Illumos family getting out of Nexenta, uh, you probably, if you want to get the, the smaller upgrade pass, go to another Illumos family. May that be Nexenta itself, newer version, open Indiana, OmniOS, SmartOS. Um, we also uh, looked at uh, FreeBSD and uh, the Linux with the Zol support. So uh, the first one that we rejected quite quickly was Linux with Zol support. Back in the time when we started, there was no uh, mainstream distribution providing Zol. And given that they don't like the CDDL license, uh, the, the module cannot be uh, integrated into the mainstream kernel, meaning that if we want to upgrade our own version of the kernel, we have to make sure that there is no incompatibility with the module, which is something we didn't want to. We really want to, okay, here is my kernel. It should work out of box. I don't have to have a lot of, to, to, to spend a lot of time to just make sure that uh, this old patch is still working on that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's the reason why we removed uh, Linux. So Illumos is, seems to be the obvious so choice for us. Uh, so the first one uh, we looked at was Nexenta. So the issue for us was we wanted to keep on the community version to be able to provide patches. And when Accenta, uh, now it was not the, the situation back in the time, but now you are limited uh, for the community version uh, in the size of the disk you can support, which was uh, way below what we need. Uh, also, upstreaming is not that easy. Uh, by upstreaming, not that easy. I mean, if I provide a patch for the kernel to uh, the Illumos community, it will be committed in the Illumos, but I have no guarantee on when it will be on the next Nexenta. Or if I provide a patch to Nexenta, uh, they will uh, probably apply to their own uh, products, and I have no guarantee on when it will be uh, applied back to the Illumos community. So, Open Indiana. Uh, we tried Open Indiana. Uh, we rejected uh, quite quickly because uh, the, small, the, the community seems quite small to us. We try to communicate with those people, try to see how it works. And I didn't feel like uh, if I have a bug report, it will be quickly taken in account. I could, um, I could um, uh, get a lot of feedbacks and stuff like this. Uh, the build system is also fragile. So uh, we modified the, the operating system we have. We don't use the vanilla one. So uh, in the case of OpenLinia, we, we would have to rebuild everything, which would also be the case for uh, other operating systems. And we figured out that uh, it was breaking quite often on, on OpenIndiana back when we tested. And last thing is Python was still the Python 2.6, so the one that has, we have issues with on LMS, uh, given that on 2.7 we don't have I issues. SmartOS, so besides the fact that SmartOS tells you that they are not made to be filers, we found it very interesting uh, how it was designed, and we we still tried to uh, push it into uh, a filer uh, kind of modifications. Well, uh, we understood quite quickly why they say it's not designed to be a filer. Like um, in the, the the global zone is is hard to customize. Uh, the there is no ability to make any delegation on iSCSI or NFS into a given zone, so I couldn't have. Uh, a zone that will uh, be, that I could customize as much as I want to be able to do uh, everything. And, uh, well, they tell it, it's not designed to make filers. Um, beside that, on Illumos, we figured out that the way we are um, exporting SQZ is not designed for that. So maybe we missed some points, but um, that's, with that pull import, it was the two things that makes the, the, the boot very, very slow. 
And so for exposing targets, we had to run two commands. Uh, and when we have 1,000 targets to expose to ice, because it takes a lot of time to talk to the daemon, make sure that the first one is uh, exposed, and then talk again and make sure the, the second one is exposed. And so we tried also through the SMF, because we can uh, precede uh, things, but given the, um, I would say, uh, the nature of the way we're exposing ice, because it didn't fit very well inside SMF. Uh, and we still had to, to patch uh, part of the kernel for modifications uh, we had. So then we, we looked at FreeBSD. So, oh, yes? Um, did you look at OmniOS? Uh, not at the time. Uh, I wasn't aware of OmniOS. And so now I am, <laughs> but it's too late. <laughs> um, so FreeBSD. Well, the reason we went to test FreeBSD, it has very good points for us. It, strong reputation on, on storage for a while. It has support for modern ZFS and uh, it has DTrace. Um, it has CTLD since FreeBSD 10. CTLD is very, very good uh, iSCSI uh, daemon that supports all the features and way more than we expected. And that had, the way it works is very uh, close to um, our needs. Like we can just create very quickly uh, um, configuration files and then send says to reload and then in one second uh, we have all the SQG exported while uh, with the daemon and the communication with the daemon on, uh, on Elomos uh, we had something like 10, uh, 15 minutes for the most, uh, the one with the more data sets. Uh, it has a good NFS support so uh, we were very happy to figure out that we won't have a regression uh, versus uh, the, the one we had on, on Elomos. We don't have uh, MDB, uh, but we figured out the usage we made of MDB at Gandhi was mostly things that we are available on FreeBSD through syscontrols. So it was mostly tuning, uh, and those tunings uh, could be done through syscontrols uh, in live on FreeBSD. And for other parts, we can uh, use uh, KGDB for that. Uh, and if we want to um, to make safe manipulation with KGDB, we can script KGDB with Python. So it was very nice to. Um, alternative to MDB in our case. Um, it has fast Deadpool import because uh, it has been threaded since uh, by the most people and we got the merge of that. Uh, we got still issue at the beginning to get fast Deadpool import uh, because we forgot to uh, disable the trim support we have, which was uh, costing uh, a lot of time. Like it was 80% of the time spent on the Deadpool import was due to uh, trim commands on the um, cache disks, which were SSDs. Um, the other thing we had to disable is the mechanism to um, the mechanism on FreeBSD to have the zip, the ZFS share and FS uh, working is very very uh, not efficient to um, for fast that put in pod because uh, for each data set that have share and FS it will create a new entry in etc ZFS export and then signal the Moundy daemon. And then when the signal is OK, go to the next one. And it was costing us, I think, I don't remember, but uh, a few, few minutes. Uh, so we ended up just not uh, starting this filer with uh, Mount D and then getting our middle, middleware uh, starting Mount D whenever we need it. The bad thing about FreeBSD is uh, because we wanted an unattended setup, we decided to go to a diskless uh, installation. Uh, so we wanted something where the operating system live in, in a RAM disk and have all the disks available uh, for actually serving data. <coughs> and we didn't want to use NFS for that uh, because we wanted, as soon as the filer is booted, we want it to be, uh, be uh, self-hosted and standalone so we don't depend, we don't have uh, failures due to uh, the NFS server rebooting or whatever or network outage. So um, we figured out quickly that FreeBSD has very, very bad support for this class booting. Uh, I will explain a bit more like that. But uh, it's very, very slow if you make a large MFS route. By large MFS route, I mean something which is a few gigs. Uh, we have a system which is around two gigs. And uh, in that case, MFS route took forever to boot. So we had to work around that. And because it has no multi-boot support, it couldn't fit into our um, setup. So we have other things that boot through uh, network on, in this less mode, 
and we use IPXE for that, so we want to IPXE over HTTP basically. And uh, on FreeBSD, it's very hard to uh, to do that because um, um, our loader is not able to fetch over HTTP, uh, and uh, we had to modify IPXC if we want to do that because IPC don't know any operating system that is not booting in multiboot. Uh, so the design of this file, so as I said, uh, we decided to go to our disk class. Uh, why did we wanted to go to disk, uh, disk class is uh, because we wanted to be uh, easily backtracking. So we have those next center filers right now. Uh, we wanted to be able to boot on the new filers. And if we discover that what we've set up on FreeBSD is not stable enough, we just have to reboot and we reboot on the disks where the next center is still there. And as long as we have not run the DFS upgrade or the pull upgrade, then um, the next center can still uh, provide the services. So it was a very nice approach to be able to um, slowly change all our filers to FreeBSD. And if something goes very bad, we're back into uh, the servers where we know that it works for a while. Uh, the other reason is uh, to upgrade. Uh, if we want to upgrade now, we just have to, to uh, populate uh, our new images on the Pixie server and simply reboot the server and we got on the on the new image. If we want to backtrack again, we just uh, swap this version, reboot again, and we're back on the old version. Uh, so to do that, we needed to get a totally unattended setup via Puppet. So when the, the operating system boot, Puppet is specializing the, the server to say, okay, I'm this kind of filer and I'm serving this kind of things and I need those uh, configuration exactly, the uh, network setup, and stuff like this. Um, we wanted to be free from admin heroes. Uh, so by admin heroes, I mean the people that, are, oh, I have an issue, uh, it's four in the morning, I will just connect to the box, modify this and this and this settings, and then tomorrow for sure I will make sure that the Puppet database is up to date. And of course, uh, the day after they forgot. So uh, the Good things about this design is as soon as you reboot, then you're back to uh, the old situation, uh, to before the change the, the, the admin heroes has made. So doing that, uh, they are enforced to put that modification into Puppet. Um, and that's mostly the reason for uh, the disk class setup. So as I said, FreeBSD is bad to, uh, to, to boot on network, so what we ended up doing uh, to be able to, to fast boot those servers was um, as soon as a DHCP request uh, uh, is done, then we get information about the TFTP, of course, so we get the, the Pixie boot, we get the basic configuration, we get the kernel, and we get a very, very minimal uh, system. Uh, by minimal system, I mean uh, a FreeBSD uh, user land with only uh, 3.5 uh, megabytes. So on TFTP, we, we fetch as, as minimum as possible of things. Um, we, we then boot that environment. That environment has a special RC, and this RC will just uh, fetch over uh, HTTP a larger environment, extract it into a RAM disk that we will create, and then we reroute in that hard disk. Uh, the reason to do that way is uh, because at the moment we, we want to do HTTP fetching, we will be having the full FreeBSD kernel, we'll have the full drivers, so we'll have uh, one or, or four gigs or ten gigs, uh, one or ten gigs depending on the, the NICs we have, so we are very fast to, to fetch this uh, image. And um, you extract everything, you get the configuration, you get the Puppet minimum configuration, certificates, whatever are needed for Puppet to run, uh, you extract everything in your uh, RAM disk and then you reroute. Reroute is a new feature from FreeBSD we have been testing extensively. Um, and then on the reroute is done, you get back into the phase where uh, RC is starting everything. So we had to uh, add a new um, rc.d.z pool that will uh, look up all of this to figure out where if there is um, a z pool available because as we are diskless, we don't have the z pool.cache. Uh, so we added a new script that just look up on all the disks, either the Deadpool import, and we're done. Then Puppet run. Uh, we start the, the Gandhi middleware, and Gandhi middleware will start running all our services. Doing that, we went down for, from 45 minutes to boot, uh, I mean 45 minutes, including the BIOS, uh, to boot to uh, uh, around five minutes. 
So it was very huge improvement. And when we got the server crashed, and you want to get the service back very uh, quickly, uh, you're very happy to um, to have been able to to reboot fast. So. Gandhi is also willing to uh, contribute back. We don't want to be alone on our um, on the thing we're doing. So uh, to we made a couple of contributions while working on those filers. The first one is uh, our middleware is written in, in Python. So we looked up all around uh, us what uh, Python library uh, were existing for ZFS. And we figured out that the Freenas people were uh, writing a very good one uh, called PY libzfs. So we ended up into uh, getting the PY libzfs. We added support for clone, which was not added yet at the time. We added support for promote, which, which is a function we use a lot. Uh, to, we added support for setting custom properties. We use a lot of custom properties to uh, specialize uh, some of the data sets we use. Um, and uh, we implemented the volume support because on FreeNAS it was only uh, the file system support that was used. And of course we did a bunch of bug, uh, bug fixing. We added a new bugs and they fixed our bugs. So it's a win for everyone. Uh, they are happy uh, to get more testers. We are happy to see them improving uh, the library we're using. We also figured out, so we are using, the, the card we're using, um, we're missing the tool. So on FreeBSD for the LSA, LSA cards, usually uh, you get um, a user and tool that allows you to manipulate, get information, and you don't have to go through uh, the usual uh, tools that are provided by uh, um, various uh, vendors. And we figured out that it, it was missing for the cards we're using. And looking around, we figured out that um, Netflix was working on adding those tools. So we asked them to provide the source. We took the source, we made it, we integrated it into the build FreeBSD build system, and we made sure that it was available in FreeBSD, and so now it's it there. Uh, we modified it to be able to implement the flashing of the firmware and the BIOS, so now we don't have to depend anymore on the um, on the LSI tools to do all this stuff. We have everything out of box in a regular FreeBSD. <coughs> we also, I mean, contribution is not only co contributing code, is not only uh, contributing patches, it's also uh, testing features that are coming. So uh, we wanted to boot fast, and so the faster we boot, the better we are. For that, we needed uh, patches that we saw uh, that some people in FreeBSD were working on. We needed the reroute thing, which is basically uh, you boot in an environment, you prepare another disk, and then you can say, OK, can you restart the boot phase, the user land boot from this new directory, uh, this new disk, instead of uh, the one I was on? And uh, Trust was working on that. So we grabbed the patch. We tested it extensively. We figured out some issues with it in various setup. And there were some. Uh, some, uh, a lot of discussion occurring around that. And in the end, it's part of the FreeBSD 11. Um, it also made a mechanism, which is a smart arm and short wait. So before that, FreeBSD was waiting for all the devices to be available when it has to uh, mount uh, the root file system. While now, as soon as the first one that you expect is available, then it can start mounting and go next on the phase and let the kernel uh, discover other disks later. Uh, we wrote sysutil, so there was no utility on FreeBSD available uh, in the base system to be able to handle uh, SES devices. Uh, we got uh, the the module, well, the, we got the kernel support. So for every uh, JBOD or card that supports uh, exposing a SES device, then we got the, the, the slash dev, uh, the character device available, but we are not able to communicate with it and do anything with it. Uh, there was some code available in the example directory, so we grabbed stuff from there, we modified it, and we created the sysutil uh, command. Uh, so the goal of the sysutil command was first to blink the disks, because of course when you want to send someone in the data center, you want to tell him which disks should be changed when a disk is broken. And uh, we also uh, wanted it to be able to um, shut all the LEDs uh, at the same time, because often someone 
ask to blink a disk, then forget about it, then you send someone and there is three disks blinking, which one you want to remove, then you can say, uh, um, uh, disable all the LED and then activate the one that I need. Uh, that was the first thing, and since we have updated it, so now it can maps uh, and can provide you a map of everything which is uh, available through um, behind your SES device. So you can get information on uh, the fans, on uh, the sensors. Uh, soon we will add a firmware upgrade, uh, so you can update your firmware without relying on external tools. Um, but. There were, some can say that there were also tools that Sysutils that could do that. So there are the vendor tools that could uh, do that. If you use the LSI tool, then you can uh, also blink your disk if you need to. The thing is, because we have two kinds of cards, we have SAS2, SAS3, we ended up with two different uh, tools from LSI to be able to, um, to be able to, to blink the tool. So either we wrote a wrapper that discovers and so the, the, the ops only get one tool to do that, or uh, because SES is very common interface to do that and can do that, uh, we went to um, the SES uh, version, which was better. And if tomorrow there is a new make a new um, hardware that provides SES, then we will automatically have uh, it working out of box without having a new one. The other thing is those tools are very uh, unfriendly, have a very unfriendly UI. Uh, try to figure out that your DA7 is the one you want, uh, which one it is and which command you have to pass to be able to blink exactly uh, DA7 uh, and not something else. It's, well, I found it very, very uh, unfriendly and uh, very um, confusing. And second is, as soon as you start this tool, you will quickly see on FreeBSD a lot of yelling in your kernel logs. Uh, I don't know what it's doing badly, uh, but if you look at your kernel logs, as soon as you run those tools, uh, you're full of noise. And if you're monitoring your logs, uh, it's a pain. The other tool that exists to do that was, uh, so this one is uh, open source and free available, SG3. Um, why we didn't end up with using SG3, which has SGSS, which is a fully, full feature uh, tool to handle SES. Well, the first reason is it's really, really, really unfriendly UI as well. Uh, have you ever tried to look at the man page, try to, um, again, map the A7 with something on your, uh, on your GBOD? It's a pen. Uh, also, um, this tool was uh, very hard to, because of the complex UI, it was very hard to uh, make into a wrapper, uh, a reliable wrapper. So if you get back to this, in the end, uh, says util, uh, on FreeBSD is as simple as that. Please just locate TA3 and put it on or off. If you want to, to uh, disable everything, then take all your disks off. And this should be portable as the SES protocol is uh, uh, common. Uh, everything that provides slash dev slash SES should be able to uh, use that tool. And thanks, Alan Jude, uh, he updated the tool to add uh, New feature, I don't remember exactly which one, but they updated the tool to add new features. Um, on the contribution part, the other thing we did is, uh, so we had Pixie Boot. Pixie Boot on FreeBSD on t with, is designed to get uh, the loader through Pixie and then get everything over NFS. As I said, we don't want NFS. Uh, so there was a patch, uh, well, it's not a patch. If you rebuild with the custom flags, the Pixie Boot, then you could have access to a TFTP file system. Except that this TFTP file system was not, uh, well, it was painful to use because it decided that, okay, all my operating system would be at the root of the, Pix of the Pixie server. And there was no way to say, oh, no, my my kernel and my configuration will be in slash filer, slash this version, slash that, blah. So I can have two or three versions uh, together. So we modified the Pixie Boot to get um, information via the HTTP, the root pass that was actually used already for NFS, so that when we boot over TFTP, we can get the kernel and um, the, the minimal uh, RAM disk over NFS, uh, over TFTPFS. We are running ahead. 
so why are we running ahead on the server? Uh, and why are we not running stable? Oh, there's multiple reasons why we're running ahead. Uh, the first reason is head is stable most of the time. Uh, as long as you make sure to follow the mailing list, what has been committed, most of them is very, very stable. Um, most of the needed feature we had were in head and not yet in FreeBSD 10. Like uh, recently, there was a lot of merging from OpenZFS into uh, FreeBSD, including uh, a threaded Deadpool import, including um, um, resumable ZFSN and stuff like this. And so we needed that. So we had the choice of either merging back into uh, FreeBSD 10 everything or just run on head. Um, we, when we started, we got a bunch of patches we wanted to upstream. And so maintaining those patches directly on head was way easier for us to uh, upstream and to make sure that uh, the day we want to upstream, we don't have the pain to uh, having to, buy, to port everything to the latest head, which is a bit different from what we had in 10. Um, and the good point for us was also to be able to find bugs regarding our workload as soon as possible. Uh, we we really want to, we have a very de defined workload. We know exactly uh, how many IOPS we will have. We know exactly uh, that everything will go through NFS, iSCSI, whatever. So we exactly control where we don't want, we know exactly where we don't want to have bugs. So we can reproduce things. And uh, so running ahead is, uh, okay, I have a bug there. I can bug uh, whoever is responsible for this bug and then it will be fixed in the next days. While if it's in FreeBSD 10.0, uh, then maybe the guy is working on something else. And then you bug him and you say, okay, I will first finish what I did and then get back to fixing uh, only when he has time. So we are closer to the moment when we discover a bug, we are closer to the moment where the bug was introduced. So we are closer to get people reactive enough to be able to fix. And because as I said, uh, our workload is very, very well identified. It was easy to, uh, to really test. So now that we have something stable, we don't have any more patches that has not been upstream besides just one or two simple, we might get back into a stable version. Uh, but as soon as we have more new patches, we will get back into running ahead in production. Because we want to run ahead, uh, then uh, we need the test lab. Uh, we need to make sure that each time we make an update of our filer on a new revision, uh, we have tested everything uh, we need, uh, all the workload we have, so that we're stable enough to get into production. So we, we started writing uh, a test lab based on uh, Zopkyo. So Zopkyo is a distributed test framework in Python. Um, and in that test lab, we're simulating uh, broken disks using GNOP. Thank you a lot, Pavel, for having writing GNOP. It's very, very useful. Uh, you can fake how many uh, write error, read errors you can have, so you can see how uh, ZFS will react on that and when it will be degraded, whatever. It is very, very useful. Uh, we want to simulate uh, bad network access using IPFW with Dominet, so we can also do the same kind of things with GNOP that we do with GNOP for the disks. Um, we want to be able to make sure that if uh, we will simulate a crash, so we, we, we will ask the filer to panic in the middle of very, very uh, high load from the clients, on I both in iSCSI and NFS. We want to make sure that at the reboot, first, it's still fast, and second, the service is uh, back to, well, the filer is back to service and still providing everything properly uh, without the, the nodes notifying or with less impact on the different nodes. Um, and while, of course, this kind of, of test lab should be very, will be very um, uh, long to run, so we wanted to be able to have uh, a profile-based a profile -based test lab, so you run every test, or you just run uh, this particular test, which is, let's say, crashing under high load, and so you just ask the test lab to run those tests, because you know that the patch of testing is just the one that fix an issue you figure out on the high load. We have a lot of future plans for um, uh, our filers. Uh, so we want to improve uh, Sessutil. I know some people asked about uh, using uh, Libexo for that. 
I would be more into uh, writing kind of library uh, for Sashutil and having Sashutil being just a consumer of this library. Maybe both, I don't know. So we want to add uh, microcode update support so that you can update the firmwares from your JBOD. Um, we want to extend the location support, locate support so that we can blink also uh, um, the sensors, the fan, and everything that can be located on the JBOD. Uh, so this is, we wanted to improve more the uh, Z-Pool import speed, uh, but we figured out that our last, e since I wrote those slides, we figured out our last issue was just by how on FreeBSD, uh, MOMD is uh, signal all the time. So now that we move that, we are in a very, very efficient, well, we find the Z-Pool import very efficient uh, for our needs. So I don't think we will do anything there. Maybe find a new mechanism for share and FS, uh, which will be FreeBSD specific. Um, we want to modify, I know other people are working on that, so if they are faster than we are, we will be happy to test. Uh, but to modify um, the tunable like ArcMax in something which we can modify uh, at runtime instead of having uh, it in, uh, in the loader.conf. Um, we want to, uh, we have some ideas on how to uh, improve reliability on our server that might end up into some some new features for the DFS, but we want to keep that as a surprise for the day we manage to do that. Uh, but we have some reliability uh, improvement in mind. We might end up into uh, either implement uh, FreeBSD specific loader into iPixie so that we can use iPixie instead of having our TFTP server we have right now. And that will simplify a bit the way we boot. Or we might try to work on turning the FreeBSD kernel into a multi-boot kernel so that we can boot it through any loader that knows how to boot uh, multi-boot. Uh, given that multi-boot is, uh, for people that don't know, is a specification written long ago by the Grub people, I think, which has been followed since by Linux, NetBSD, Lemos, and we are the only one I know, maybe OpenBSD or so. Uh, not using uh, the, the multi-boot. The thing with the multi-boot is it has impacts on, on mechanism we rely on right now to, uh, instead of uh, having to load the modules in advance in memory, whatever, you need to pass argument to the kernel. So it's tricky to, to add to FreeBSD right now. Uh, we plan to modify uh, cam control. Uh, so we are abusing a little bit uh, ice cozies. So instead of having a few targets with a lot of LUN, uh, we have a lot of targets with very few LUNs. Meaning that the 256, the 256 uh, default targets on CTL was not enough. And so we had to, to patch it. Uh, we also patched back in the time the, um, the next center, uh, as because target for the same reason. Uh, so we might just want to modify it so that instead of patching the kernel, uh, instead of patching the, the, the kernel module for that, we can just have a syscontrol that allows us to decide uh, what, is, what is the number of um, targets we can expose. Or we can also uh, change the, the way we do things to get less targets and more lens. We wanted to modify uh, the daemon for, for the cam target layer to use libucl uh, for the configuration so that we could have um, one file for configuration, a default configuration, and number write, something like that. But uh, the thing is, it's too late. Someone did it before us. So now we have it. Uh, we plan to implement a bunch of, um, of Storage relating tooling, we had a lot of D-Trace uh, script that we got from Illumos uh, when we were on, on NextCenter. Some of them work out of box on FreeBSD, a lot of them need to be updated, so our plan is to uh, get them into a state where they work on FreeBSD and commit them into FreeBSD so people have direct access to uh, those scripts. Uh, we plan to improve the GL multipass, so 
the algorithm of GM multipass is very bad for ZFS on an Illumos. They modified, I think it's MPXIO uh, to add a mechanism uh, for multipass, which is more adapted to uh, the way ZFS works. So we have plans to uh, modify, to add a new, uh, a new mechanism in, in uh, a new algorithm in uh, GM, GM multipass. Um, which will allow us to get a multi-master uh, active active uh, which plays nicely with uh, ZFS. And we're done. So do you have any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, what I didn't mention is now we are modifying loader uh, EFI to do the same thing as Pixieboot, the modification we did in Pixieboot. Uh, yeah, we considered that, but it's way more work than the TFTP thing. And it's still not efficient because when you do Pixieboot, you don't have access to the full speed of your card, of your NICs. And our goal is to fetch as, uh, with full speed 10 gigs if we can do 10 gigs. So IPXE, IPXE, they have all the Linux drivers uh, for the Nix inside IPXC. So when they boot, they have uh, full speed drivers. While if we modify our uh, loader, that e, uh, EFI loader, uh, we won't have the full speed. Okay, thank you.